Happy Laetare Sunday, friends. I'm hanging out. Am I kind of crooked? I'll lean for you. That'll make it feel better. I'm hanging out in the parking lot of the church where I grew up. This was the community that introduced me to Jesus. I wasn't baptized here, but I made my first technical confession here. I uh, made my first communion here. I was confirmed here. Uh, my parents actually met here. My father's buried here. I spent most of my adolescence here. And this weekend is the 20th anniversary of my conversion, of meeting Jesus. Um, and I, I think I may be writing on that in the next few days, God willing, uh, because it's just been a beautiful thing meditating on 20 years um, and all that he's done and everything in my life that I never, never anticipated was going to happen. Not least the hobo thing, of course, but, you know, just seeing how much he loves me. And I had a a beautiful moment. I was praying, um, doing my holy hour up at this retreat with these middle school girls. And they were beautiful, beautiful girls, challenging in many ways. Um, but it was such a joy to be with them. And I was praying and I was before the Blessed Sacrament and I was just looking at Jesus and saying, 20 years, 20 years. I have some inkling of what those of you who've been married feel when you celebrate that, that major milestone. And I was looking at him and I was like, Lord, there is no earthly reason that you should put up with me. There is no earthly reason. And then, of course, I caught myself and I was like, okay, no, but there are heavenly reasons. But, you know, as I was just sitting there, like, what have I ever done to deserve you? Like, there's no reason you should love it, love me. There's, And, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm the worst. It was just like, I know myself. Like, I know that I know that you knew what you were getting into when you started to love me. I know that you were fully aware of the fact that I was just going to. I was going to be a Pharisee and I was going to be a jerk and I was going to be a hypocrite and I was going to be all kinds of, all kinds of mess. Um, and you chose me anyway. And so there I was praying like, God, there's no reason that you should want me. And there was someone who was about to give a talk and she was testing the audio system. And this song I sang for y'all the other day come on, came on, um, all of me, right? John Legend. And I've prayed that song a hundred times, you know, all of me loves all of you, all your curves and all your edges. But it was it was the opening line that came on. And so I was there and I was like, Lord, there's no reason you should love me. And I heard, what would I do without your smart mouth? And I was just like, oh, and that was it. That was it. That was where it stopped. But, you know, it was like God was looking at me like, <laughs> you are a ridiculous disaster. You absolutely are. And I love every bit of that ridiculous disaster. What would I do? without you. You know, and just to meditate on that, that God doesn't look at me and say like, oh my gosh, you're perfect in every possible way, right? He looks at me and he's like, every, every little ridiculous idiosyncrasy, every, every bit of the mess that you are is just such a delight. And yeah, so I'm just feeling really blessed, really blessed in this anniversary, really blessed in this retreat, and particularly blessed that my anniversary, I don't know the exact date. I just know that it was this March retreat, um, the St. Mark Confirmation Retreat in 1997. And um, so I just sort of celebrate it every time I go back to do that retreat. Um, and this year, my anniversary weekend was the Feast of the Annunciation, which is my favorite feast day of all time, and Laetare Sunday, which is Joy Sunday in Lent. So I don't know. He's just, he's just really particularly fond of me. Um, so... I'm feeling, I'm feeling loved on. Um, I just want to look at John 9, mostly because it's already 4.30 and I need to be in Manhattan, ASAP, and that's a hike. But, you know, I just want to look at um, this man born blind. Now, this man born blind, this is sort of like my trump card miracle. You know, like people want to say that these miracles are faked. Okay, fine. Like maybe, maybe you fake that woman who was sick and then she wasn't sick anymore or like, the guy who was tired and he wasn't tired anymore, but a man born blind, how are you going to fake that? Right? You got to, you got to whisper to him in his cradle. I'm going to need you to pretend to be blind for like 40 years. Oh, and by the way, he's, he's of age, right? He's old enough. He's older than Jesus. So we're now supposed to think that before Jesus was born, somebody went and found this baby and was like, Hey, I've got a plant coming, okay? Like, I've got a fake messiah. I'll give you a hundred bucks if you just pretend to be blind for your entire life. It's just ridiculous, right? I mean, everybody knew him. His parents knew that he was born blind, and nobody had ever cured a man born blind before. And 
outside of the power of Jesus Christ, nobody's done it since. It's not something that medicine has figured out yet. If you're born blind, that's just the end of it. But Jesus comes in and he works the miracle. It's the very beginning because the miracle isn't really the point, right? This We had a long gospel, you remember today. It was John 9, 1 through 41. Well, the miracle happened in verse 7. And interestingly, Jesus works this miracle with stuff. He spits on the ground, makes clay with his saliva, smears the clay on his eyes and says, go and wash, right? So this is a powerful witness to the fact that we need sacraments, that we're not just spiritual beings, that we're also physical beings. And we need we need the sacraments that use stuff to make those spiritual realities comprehensible at any level for us. But he also asks him to participate in that. You know, it's not just like, whoo, and you're healed. It's go and do something at the pool of Siloam, right? Not not just any pool. Don't like just go wash the spit off your face. Spit makes you unclean in any culture, but certainly in the Jewish culture. He says, this is the specific thing I want you to do, the specific place I want you to go. Let me see if you believe. Let me see if you trust me. So he went and washed and came back able to see. And when they ask him, you know, what happened to you? How were your eyes open? He said, the man called Jesus made clay. The man called Jesus. It's true. He is a man, but that's a very weak statement, right? Just that he is a man. That's step one for this guy. Now, interestingly, Jesus disappears from a story in verse seven, and he doesn't come back until verse 35. And I think some of us may have had this experience in our lives where God does something big and then he seems to be gone. And we spend the next decade trying to figure out who we are in the light of what God just did for us before he ever comes back into this story. Here, Jesus withdraws because this man needs his absence in order to come and believe him. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know if this guy maybe wasn't, you know, just a little bit caught up in who he was. And if Jesus was there, like, look what I did. He'd be like, yeah, cool, great. This guy, though, needs opposition. So Jesus, he pulls back and he lets the Pharisees be the one to tease out his faith. Again, many of us may have had that experience where It doesn't necessarily, for everybody, help to be in a great community of faith or to have an amazing holy family. Like maybe you were raised with an incredible family and that didn't do it for you. You needed opposition. You needed people who didn't believe to tease out what you claimed to believe before you could really take it as your own. And so, you know, this first section, 8 through 12, it's just his neighbor's. He says, the man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. Very, like, matter of fact, not like, oh my gosh, praise the Lord, isn't this amazing? Just like, oh, yeah, you know, he washed my hands, or washed my eyes. He put clay on my eyes. I washed them. Now I can see. You know, you almost feel like he's still a skeptic. He's some man. He did this. I can see now. He's not super excited. They're like, where is he now? He's not like, oh my gosh, show me. I need to follow him. He's like, I don't know. And I think we've all known people who've had some dramatic encounter with Christ and they're like, okay, cool. That was great. You know, or maybe maybe you've been that same way where you went on some retreat, it changed your life, it was incredible, it was amazing, and you came back and you were like, eh, well, you know, that was then and this is now and I didn't stay on Tabor and so I'm just going to, I'm just going to have to deal with life now. You know, he doesn't, he's encountered the person of Jesus, but not at his heart. You know, he hasn't yet been given eyes to see. He hasn't met him in any kind of a real way. So then they bring him to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are like, oh, this guy isn't from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And at this point, the blind man's like, I mean, like, I'm not necessarily ready to bow down and worship him, but he did, he, he did open my eyes, right? People are saying, well, how can a sinful man do something like this? So they ask him, like, well, who is he? He's like, I mean, he sounds like he's a prophet again. Like, man claims to be God. Man gives sight to the blind, which nobody's ever done before. All we get is he's a prophet. And Jesus is like, I'm going to stay away. I'm going to stay away. I'm going to give you some time. And let's see. Let's see what happens if you have to fight on your own for a little while. So the Jews didn't believe. They summoned his parents. Don't you love these parents? They're like, hey, parents, your son can see. And they're like, we don't know. We don't know anything about it. Talk to him. Throwing him under the bus. 
because they knew that the Jews weren't going to like it if they were like, oh, yeah, Jesus healed him. So they were like, oh, no, no, ask him. He's old enough. You go ahead. You ask him yourself. Kind of an awkward thing to do. But, you know, the story's not about the parents, right? Some of us may have had a similar experience where the people that we love don't support our conversion. And they're like, look, he's doing this Jesus thing. So, like, I don't know. You can ask him about it. And we notice that this man, he didn't need the support of his family. Maybe even he needed his family not to be supportive because they call the guy in again and they say, give God the praise, which is a way of saying, tell the truth. But I think it, here it's also a way of saying like, don't praise, praise Jesus, praise God. And we know, of course, that it's one and the same thing, right? We know that this man is a sinner. And at this point, the man born blind is just like, okay, like y'all wasting my time. All right. He says, look, if he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. And it doesn't really seem like the kind of thing that a sinner says. He's just, he's got a smart mouth, this one, right? And I think this is one reason we see this story in the Gospel of John, because John loves the irony. And so this guy's here like, okay, fine. Sure, maybe he's a sinner. But he's a sinner who can work miracles from God. So probably somebody that you should pay attention to, yeah? So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He says, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Did you want to become his disciples? Is that why you're asking? Right? That Joanian irony there. Why are you, why do you keep asking these questions? You're just trying to poke a hole in my story. But you know there's no hole. And you know that if this man opened my eyes, you know he's not a sinner. So why do you keep asking these questions? Is it because you think that my story is going to change? Or is it because deep down you don't want to know him too? And this guy, now he still doesn't know Jesus, right? He still hasn't had any kind of of a, a come to Jesus moment. He hasn't met him, really, truly met him. But because people keep being like, well, it's not true. It's not true. It's not true. He starts to react, you know, and this is something sitting here in the parking lot of the church um, where I was such a Pharisee, probably still am a Pharisee. I apologize. But, you know, sitting here, I'm just so aware of the fact that I encountered a lot of opposition when I decided I was going to follow Jesus. And if I hadn't, I don't know how Christian I would be today. You know, I am a very belligerent and combative and honorary person. And because I had people fighting me, well, I armed myself. I armed myself with scripture and I armed myself with the catechism. I started asking these questions and because it was me against the world, you know, regardless of the fact that it was me in 2000 years and like all the saints and all the angels and the grace of the Holy Spirit and all that mess. It was me against the world, and so I was going to triumph. And God was like, you know what? <laughs> You're an arrogant jerk, but we can work with that, right? And it's amazing to me to see the way that our lives and our conversions are broken and ugly and filled with sin. And God works even through those. You know, I mean, this man who doesn't seem particularly want anything to do with him, but... He was stubborn and Jesus was like, okay, cool. I'm going to pull back and I'm going to let you be stubborn until you start to realize that maybe you do need me. And they say, oh no, you're his disciple. We're, we're Moses' disciple. We know God spoke to Moses. We don't know where this man is from. The man says, mm, that's what's interesting. You don't know where he's from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know God doesn't listen to sinners. If one's devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. You begin to see that this man may have some education. If this man were not from God, here's step three, right? So we had step one. He said, the man called Jesus. Step two against the pro uh, the Pharisees, he called him a prophet. Now, the third time, he's uh, gone before these people who are like, clearly he's a sinner, and he says he is from God. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. Then they threw him out. That's when Jesus shows back up. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him, because Jesus is always seeking us. And he waited for the moment when the guy was was firmly in his camp by his own choice. Because this guy couldn't be dragged in. This guy couldn't be wooed in by great praise and worship music and a really emotional experience. This guy needed to fight his own way in before he was embraced by the Son of God and transformed into a saint. Then Jesus says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy, he's still, he's still holding back a little bit. But you can see the readiness there. Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? He's like, I want more information, but I'm ready. 
I'm ready, just give me more, Jesus says, you have seen him. And the one speaking with you is he. He says, I do believe, Lord, and worshipped him. Falls down at his knees and worships him. Now, I'd have to I'd have to look it up. Hey, if you've got some free time and you're not driving to Manhattan today, and I guess by the time I post this, I'll be in Manhattan. Whatever, I'm busy. If you want to look this up and find out for me, is this the first time anybody worships Jesus? In John's Gospel, I mean, maybe. I would, I would have to look. I would have to look. But it is striking here that this man, given no other instruction than the one speaking with you is he. I am the son of man. What does that mean? Doesn't matter. He bows down and worships. He recognizes him as Lord. And it's because Jesus played his cards right. You may have people in your life who are far from the Lord, but God could be working. You may have people who have had every opportunity to turn to the Lord and they haven't done it, but God is working. You may have people who have been running from God for years, but God is still working. In the eyes of the man born blind, well, it it happens fast, but it's not what we would expect. The healing of his eyes, that's not what changes him. It's having to fight alone. That's what changes him. We don't know what God is doing in converting the ones we love. We don't know what God is doing in converting our own hearts. But just because it's not working in the way that you expect it to does not mean that he's not working. So friends, let's trust that God who loves us and loves our beloved far more than we ever possibly could is doing everything in his power, in his all-powerful power to transform them and bring them to himself. Rejoice, my friends. Laetare.